this Atlanta Hustle team has been really impressive. Super explosive team. They're playing with a lot of confidence. This team is going to work harder than they've ever worked before. Playing the New York Empire is often a daunting task, but if there's a team that's up to it, Atlanta may be it. Burnett closing the space. Let him cook. Justin Burnett. Yacht does it one more time against the Hustle. Holds fire. <laughs> Can't stop him. You can only hope to contain Antoine him. Antoine Davis has the score against his old team. This New York franchise has redefined excellence. Welcome back. It's Swing Pass. I'm Adam Ruffner. That is Cameron Brock, and we've got a week two preview pod coming at you. Nine games on tap, and we're continuing the momentum after a big week one filled with nine matchups as well. But at the center of this weekend's upcoming games has to be the Super Series matchup featuring the reigning champion New York Empire and their record-setting 31-game winning streak traveling down to Atlanta to face the Hustle, the last team to beat the Empire during the regular season way back in July of 2021. So Cam, I'll bring you in here and really bring you to the centerpiece of this Super Series matchup between New York and Atlanta. What do you like most heading into this battle between two Titans? Um, well, one thing I like is that Matt Smith is going to be at the game. So uh, it looks like Atlanta is going to be a little bit closer to full strength after having a couple of key absences last week. And same thing with the Empire. We have both Shar Talks in the house this week, so uh, the brothers won't have to be riding solo. Uh, I, I'm just really excited to watch this matchup because I think both teams were pretty unhappy with how they played offensively last week. Um, and I, this is going to be kind of the, the time for them to have that rebuttal. Like, was last week a sign of things to come? Or are they going to make the tweaks and adjustments necessary to prove that these can still be two of the top offensive teams in the league. Because, you know, Austin looked largely ineffective, especially after the first quarter against Carolina. And the Empire, while they did sneak out a win, you mentioned uh, in our last pod how they kind of had to do the break in, cl- in case of emergency and bring John Randolph onto the O-line at certain points. Um, Montreal kept that game pretty close after it looked like New York was going to maybe run away with it. Uh, Montreal crept back in and really made it a competitive game. So I think both teams are going to be looking to get on track offensively. From a defensive perspective, Empire still look great. I mean, the Empire still have playmakers across the board on defense. The hustle, I, I like some pieces they have on defense. I don't think they were quite as impressive as what New York was last week and what New York's been, you know, for multiple seasons now. Um, but I think both my eyes are going to be locked onto both offenses and seeing if they can kind of make the jump to where we expect them to be versus where they were last week. So New York, of course, winning last week, picking up their 31st straight win, a UFA record. Atlanta falling by eight goals at Carolina. So while both teams coming in a little bit under expectations, Atlanta really trying to avoid this 0-2 hole. We mentioned at the end of last episode on Swing Pass how that isn't necessarily a death sentence for this hustle team. But it's definitely one foot in the bucket in a South division that features three championship contenders, it seems, in Atlanta, Austin, and Carolina. On New York's side, and just uh, taking care of a few laundry list items, you mentioned that Elliot Chartok will be available and making his 2024 debut for New York, uh, as well as Josue Aloro, a big-time defender for the Empire defense adding in another starting caliber kind of hybrid, able to cover backfield and downfield as well. Um, Sean Keegan, who did make his 2020 de- debut with New York last week, will be questionable going into Saturday's game. He finished without a turnover in his Empire uh, return last weekend, but it felt like it was a little bit of a toothless performance given how New York's M- New York's offense struggled in getting the disc into the end zone with the same sort of efficacy that they were used to when they retained two former MVPs in Ryan Osgar and Jeff Babbitt, and as well as John Lithiau being absent those scores last weekend, I felt was very evident. And while Keegan was super stable, it didn't feel like 
there was much motion in that offense uh, uh, as far as the new additions were concerned. So it'll be interesting if he can slot in and provide a little bit more oomph. And then on the Atlanta side, as far as absences last week, there was a whole slate of them. And so there will be a raft of players making their 2024 debut on Saturday night against the Empire for the Hustle. That will include the aforementioned Matt Smith, as well as Jakeem Polk, Jeremy Langdon, Billy O'Brien, and Michael Fairley. Uh, A few of those being big-time contributors in that 2021 Hustle win at home. Uh, I I wanted to get into a little bit of that game. It was a 22-21 to win for the Hustle. Last second, it w- relied on Kelvin Williams, now retired, uh, the Atlanta all-time leader in blocks. Uh, shout out to him. I uh, hope he's listening still. One of the true greats of the UFA. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he came up with a game-sealing block at the end of that. Antoine Davis was on the hustle at that point. He had, to that point, I think, uh, a career night for him. He had three assists, six goals, was 19 of 19 from the field throwing. He had seven hockey assists. I totally forgot about that in that matchup and finished with almost 600 total yards of offense. Just a truly dominant performance from Antoine. Of course, he's been the the defensive guru and standout and reigning defensive player of the year for the Empire the past two seasons. Excuse me, not he's been with the Empire the past two seasons, two seasons, but hasn't been the reigning defensive player of the year only in 2023. Uh, but Antoine was huge for the hustle in that win. For New York, Jack Williams and Ben Yacht came up with big performances. It was a highlight-filled matchup in general. And, and it was something where New York, for all of their greatness, uh, uh, they got out-punched in that game. And I think that that's one of the only times, in addition to the 2021 championship game against Carolina, where it felt like the Empire just got outright beat. Uh, that that really hasn't happened since basically the start of the 2019 season. And so I think that speaks to Atlanta's potential. What do you see going into this matchup on Saturday night as being again, that kind of maybe foothold for Atlanta to land possibly a fatal blow against this empire team? Is it again, that highlight making plays that they had in the 2021 win? And even in the first half of that 2021 playoff game, or is it something else? Is it sort of a, return to form of, I think, their balanced offensive attack that was so good last year that was so absent from their week one performance in Carolina. Where where do you kind of see the advantages for this hustle team hosting New York? If there are advantages to be had, I do think it has to be for them on the offensive side of the disc. Like they, If they can look like anything close to what they looked like the last couple of seasons, and I think we're going to be in for a very good game. Um, you know, you mentioned the people that are all coming back this week and um, some some offense, some defense. I think all are going to be very important. Um, one of the kind of untold stories of last week's New York game, uh, if you look at the statistics, you might see like, oh, Ben Yacht had four goals. Um, you know, he was... But he was only like what plus three, I think, and his plus minus, which for Ben Yacht playing on offense is about is a very pedestrian game. Ben Yacht was not the dominant force that we have seen, you know, time and time again throughout his career. Um, it was curious how uh, he just wasn't able to win his matchups. Um, and credit to Montreal for for putting the work in to make that happen. Um, but I, I, they, New York's often struggled last week. And, you know, you think back to the end of the 2023 season, right, where he was just kind of like when he got switched over to offense and deployed there for the playoffs, he was just unstoppable. Um, so I think defensively, having guys back like Jakeem Polk and having m- maybe throwing their best athletes at Benyatt, maybe that's what you got to do. That's what Montreal did last week, and it seemed to pay dividends. Uh, and then on the offensive side, they just need to complete easy passes. Like they don't need to rely on the long ball as good as they are at throwing it. I think in the they can, they can kind of get lost in throwing the long ball too often because they have been so good at it for a number of years now that they forget that what really makes their offense go is the fact that they're able to constantly have these easy open looks within 10 to 15 yards of the disc that then enable the deep throw 
And it really felt like last week they were trying to skip that middle part of completing those easy chisel throws to get to the open deep throw and instead just looking for the deep throw. Um, And you mentioned last week, like the levels of an offense, you know, your short game, your mid game, your deep game, and how you kind of need to be hitting on all of those areas to really be effective throughout a game. And I think that's as important for Atlanta as it is for anyone, because that is how they thrive in their deep game is by succeeding so much in that short game and in that mid game to lead up to those, those hucks that quite, quite literally sometimes are just picture perfect. Uh, I mean, even despite their struggles, there were a couple of looks last week um, where they did have this, this great movement and this, it, ended in a picture perfect you know maybe not even a huck but a 30 to 40 yard throw for a score that the defense had no chance at and they need to kind of get back to that yeah i agree i think that balance was lacking last weekend from atlanta i think the return of matt smith obviously will help them there it'll be interesting i think to see where langdon and billy o'brien in particular slot in last year they had a lot of defensive reps but maybe one or two of them takes a couple more points on offense in this game both of them have a lot of experience in those playmaking positions on o-line in their ufa careers so could be something where you see them slotting over One of the things we didn't get to see in 2021, but we got to see a little bit last year, was all UFA member Brett Halsmeyer and his size go up against this uh, historic, I would say, Empire defense. And I think that that figures to be a very important tilt again on Saturday night. You have Halsmeyer coming off of a 700 plus yard performance. Definitely not one of the detrimental parts in Atlanta's loss last weekend. He was out there doing his as far as producing, but he will be tasked with having to get open against, again, the reigning defensive player of the year in Antoine Davis, as well as what figures to be kind of a rotating cast of defenders in what figures to be New York, uh, throwing a couple of different looks at the big guy. I mean, again, Holzmeyer, as he demonstrated against a very good Carolina defense last year, is kind of getting to a point in his career where he's a little bit somebody who you can slow down but you can't entirely stop you can hope to contain him a bit but he's gonna go and get his and I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if Atlanta can build a little bit more of momentum off of that because you go back and you look at the stats again against the Flyers and some of the tape and there wasn't much that the Flyers could do to stop Holzmeyer but they focused everywhere else and that was enough to disrupt Atlanta. So do you think that that's a blueprint that New York utilizes as well, where they sort of say, Hey, you go score as many points as you want. Sort of, I feel like a little bit how some teams defend the Denver nuggets in the NBA, where they say, Nikola Jokic, go get yours. We're going to worry about the four shooters around you or however you spread the offense elsewhere, kind of run yourself out. It feels like, Carolina did that a little bit with the fly or excuse me, the hustle last weekend. Is that something that the empire can hope to do as well? Or do you think that Halsmeyer has another big game and it maybe ignites a little bit more now with Smith present now with, I think a refocused Atlanta team after they came out so lethargic last weekend. Like how do you think Halsmeyer impacts this New York team? Yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head of like the approach they should probably take. Like, don't just focus all your efforts on one person. I think the only time you can do that uh, defensively is when the person you're focusing is in the handler space a lot. Um, we we kind of uh, always have this joke on cats because when Pavel was with the uh, Union and at, at this point back then, the wildfire, we used to play the, our game. We would say Pavel or not Pavel. And the whole game plan was Pavel's got the disc, double team. Pavel doesn't have the disc. We'll just, we're never double teaming. We're never leaving Pavel alone. His defender follows him. And anytime he gets the disc, the other handler defender, the nearest defender goes and doubles and makes sure that he can't hurt us. Um, That doesn't work so well if you're trying to focus somebody up in the cutting space, because the thing is you can put all of your attention over where Brett Holzmeyer is, but you're leaving vulnerabilities all over the field at that point. Uh, if you do that. And I, I think especially having Matt Smith back and uh, I think that makes that job a lot harder. Uh, I think you do just say, all right, Brett, you're probably going to put up some numbers no matter who we put on you. Um, so we're going to 
try to limit you, try to slow you down. But I think you're going to really make hay defensively by focusing on just shutting each individual down. Um, and really, we saw maybe the blueprint for it from Carolina last week. Try to shut down that 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 short game, like that initiation game, because we saw multiple instances of Atlanta receiving a poll and not being able to complete more than a couple passes before things just got really gummed up and they just didn't know where to go. Uh, so taking away kind of that the short to mid range game, I think is probably where you're going to, you know, get the most bang for your buck. Well, and that is something that New York excels at. And I think your uh, highlighting of Carolina's effectiveness in that area is really apt. Uh, Carolina returned Seth Weaver after missing him all of last year. He's been a great handler defender, really underrated, I think, at the professional level. Um, and it figures that New York can kind of replicate a, a lot of that, given that they have Bretton Tan on the roster. Again, Josue Oloro will be making his 2024 debut. I kind of assume John Randolph will again start on defense. It'll be interesting if they kind of break in case of emergency, use him again on offense again. Uh, but he figures to start, I think, on D-line. And, and that, I think, could spell some trouble for the hustle given that they were stuck, I think, between their backfield space and their their third level downfield a bit too often. And that's sort of the the pain zone against this Empire defense, when they can sort of take away your middle game and either hound you in the handler space with Randolph and Bretton Tan or allow Antoine Davis, Marquez Brownlee, and sort of their canopy-level defenders to go get help Ds in deep space. Can we just take one thing we didn't touch on last week? I want to get over back to New York's offense for a second because I've been telling people in like private conversations, I've been telling people like even like this New York offense really worries me after week one. Um, and I just want to, I want to compare their first game last year to their first game this year. Not, not last year, their first game, it was pouring rain. Uh, they're playing against. Philly. I mean, the weather was awful. This week, this past week, they were playing in what looked like maybe some wind and maybe a little cold. No rain. The weather didn't look to be a huge impact on anything. But like, their stats this week, just these stats seem so non-Empire. It like blows my mind. Um, when you look at their <laughs> at their stats, Huck percentage, they were 3 out of 11, 27%. Mm-hmm. You look at their O-line conversion percentage, 43%. Mm-hmm. You look at, um, and like those numbers compared to like last year playing in a month. Oh, turnover numbers, 23 turnovers. Which mm-hmm. I, I can't even think of a game where they approached 20 turnovers in the last, during this win streak. I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure there's been a game where it's been close, but I, I can't even come up with one where they were, anywhere near 23 turnovers. And I think that is cause for concern. In a freaking monsoon last year, they had 20 turnovers. In mild weather this past week, and they had 23. Like, I, I can't, I don't think it's over, can, you can overstate that. Like, I, there are serious concerns for me of this New York O-line, and I just, I, I need to see them, like, they're confident and they feel like they still have all this talent and I get that they do, but the absences from those guys that are, are gone this year, the John Lithio, Ryan Osgar and Jeff Babbitt, like they, they felt so obvious in that first game. And I just don't know, even if they can be better than they were last week, I don't see a way they can make up that gap and just look anything close to what they've looked like. Unless some of these guys, you know, unless a Ryan Osgar, comes back and maybe slots back in. I think you're discrediting a bit the importance of Elliot Chartok to this offense, particularly Possibly. as far as his, his ability to stretch the field vertically. I, I thought that was a dimension that was really lacking in their Huck game last week. I mean, you talk about those deep splits. They're just, they were not at any kind of level that they're used to. And obviously the absence of Osgar, I think is going to be number one with a bullet and just, we're all, I think, going to be a little bit biased towards that end. But 
Chartok was incredible last year for them, man. And he's got full field range on both the forehand and the backhand side and is really comfortable in that system. Works really well and complimentary off of Salman Rushmeyer Bailey and Jack Williams. Those three as a throwing kind of trifecta work as well as any threesome in the league. And I think that that was a big part of what allowed (laughs) Osgard to kind of range around, pick his spots, and be the sort of cyborg upfield continuation thrower that we knew him to be. Obviously, they're going to still be lacking that going into this matchup in Atlanta, but I do think that Elliott's presence is going to make a pretty (coughs) decided difference as far as their ability to attack deep. I think there was a tentativeness to New York's offense last week, right? Like, They were integrating new pieces. Sean Keegan hasn't been there for several seasons. Liam Haberfield is brand new. These are very talented players. But as we've talked about many times on this show, offense isn't about just ramming home the most raw amount of talent. And you know this, I feel like, on Indy almost better than anyone else in the world. It is like assembling a watch. There Mm -hmm. is a certain alchemy almost to the calibration of the machine of an O-line, right? Like, there's there's rhythm and like an intangible level of communication and just sort of trust that exists. And I feel like New York last week had such a different formation for the first time in several years that they were playing with so much of that. And I feel like, again, Chartok is going to be a big stabilizer and a big sort of anchor for a lot of that. But Atlanta has the kind of defense where they can both, I think, challenge them, challenge the empire, excuse me, athletically and also strategically. And I think we saw that a bit in that 2021 win, as well as, again, that that 2021 playoff game where the hustle had the empire on the ropes in an elimination scenario and just kind of gave them too much breathing room. Yeah, I, I do think you're right. I think Elliot Shartok will make a big difference, but, you know, they're they're just going to have to figure out ways to make offense a little easier on themselves. I mean, you look, you look across the board too. I mean, you have multiple people on the O line with three or more throwaways in a single game. It's just very, it's very un empire. Like uh, the, the empire- systematic errors yeah. were very uncharacteristic. They did have one 23 turnover performance last year in the middle of the season at Montreal, but I can attest to that just from watching the film of that game. That was also a wind wrecked game. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was very, very kind of up down. If you were going against the wind, you were just going to sustain a turnover three each possession or each drive, I should say. Um, But that not being withstanding, we didn't really get into this last week in the preview pod, but I've got to position it to you now. Who are you taking in this matchup? Man, um, this for me was the hardest one to think about all week like when I was trying to figure out who might win this game it really to me just came down to a couple it's a couple of teams I don't think who were very happy with how they played last week but that being said I think New York still looked more put together than Atlanta did last week now Atlanta was missing more last week so you gotta take it into account to me, this is a complete toss-up. I, I, I'm slightly, ever so slightly leaning New York, but I I don't have a ton of confidence in that pick. I, I think this one is literally, given the lineups they're going to be there, given the point in the season is, if we played this exact same situation a hundred times, I would not be surprised if the final score was like 52 to 48. So um, I think this is, uh, for my money, it's going to be the closest, like most exciting game of the weekend. Um, so, but I'll, I'll say slight lean to New York on this. Yeah, I, I think if I'm skewing sort of where I'm coming from, from the gut, it's going to be Atlanta, just given that they're sort of in a bit of a corner. They're returning a lot of, I think they're kind of a, uh, uh, emotional leaders as far as the team's direction goes this weekend um you know you talk about again langdon fairly smith polk those are real galvanizing uh uh lightning rod type of dudes when they're active in the lineup and i think that that does make a difference for this atlanta team again playing at home playing in front of a really good home crowd that Mm -hmm. they've been building over the past several years at that silverback stadium 
And I do think that that is going to be a bit of a challenge for this New York team that in years past, they would go into these road matchups and they would so easily don the heel sort of identity. They would come in and want to ruin your parade and they would be festive in doing so, right? I mean, that was sort of the almost puckish amusement of Osgar as well as Ben Yacht and even Jack Williams a bit. I mean, playoff Jack, I think almost had this kind of rap scallion sort of quality to him where you know it's the evil empire you're almost rooting against them because they're so good and here's jack williams making every clutch play imaginable and and that was sort of the vibe that new york had going on the road it was sort of like this this traveling almost globe trotting show and where they were last weekend that doesn't seem to be what's going to be heading on the road into atlanta on saturday night and and that worries me in the up opposite direction for New York because I think that that sort of show of force was so central to how they competed not necessarily their talent difference or anything else but I mean we've talked about numerous times how they sort of ran these teams off a championship week in the past two years and it wasn't because they were so much differently enabled than their competitors but because they came out so forcefully and I don't see that in the cards necessarily on Saturday night I think that they're gonna have to feel out this Atlanta team and I think that that sort of lethargy again sort of what we saw against Montreal last weekend of all teams a team on a uh what were they on I I wrote about in today's power rankings but it's escaping me they're on like a 19 game losing streak or something uh uh that New York looks so vulnerable against them. I, I'm worried about them on the road against Atlanta. I, 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 I hear you about the slight hedge towards the empire, but I don't know about that. I think that Atlanta is going to come out with their own kind of power after falling so heavily on the road against a divisional rival in the Flyers last weekend. I think that Atlanta absolutely knows the stakes at hand in this game. Well, Quick question. If who would you be more concerned about moving forward if they lost this game, New York or Atlanta? Atlanta, I think, just given where it would put them in the division. I think for New York, you could even hear it in how the team was sort of talking about getting to 31 games this past week. I think almost for their own selves, they need to let off of the throttle a bit. It's a tremendous weight to carry a kind of win streak like this forward. I, I We've seen it in so many different sports. I think most readily to like the NBA and sort of the 2016 Warriors when they set the winning record and just sort of the, the gargantuan have to sort of having to carry that through the postseason and anoint themselves as the best team ever because they have the most wins and they just couldn't do it you also think back to the Patriots team that went undefeated until the David Tyree catch in the Super Bowl against the Giants I'm starting to get those vibes about the Empire heavy is the crown right like this is yeah it's it's a lot to have to keep being perfect and that's what's been expected of New York now for two plus years and you can just you feel the strain right yeah I mean they clearly are feeling are you know they I mean we kind of saw it as much with like Ryan Osgar being like you know I just need some time like it's a lot as of somebody well and I, I'm I kind of mentioned that I think at the time like Osgar is somebody who's competed on like semifinals or better teams since he was 19 years old yeah it's a lot of high pressure games so just a lot of games in general yeah i mean it it happens uh yeah i think i i think honestly i'm almost in the opposite direction and kind of for the same reasons it's like you've you've kind of been impenetrable for so long that like what does it do to a team if they finally you know they have all these losses there's kind of these questions from the outside about can you sustain and kind of push through those losses and then your second game in you lose. So like, do the doubts start to creep in? Do quite, you know, do you start to kind of question what you have and if you can muster up the strength and the ability to go and win another title? Like, I feel like a lot of doubt can set in early in a season. Whereas if they lose a game, say six, seven games in after they've kind of proven that they have, kind of withstood 
these uh, adjustments to the roster, I feel like maybe it doesn't quite affect you as much. So I could kind of see it both ways. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm not really worried about Atlanta in the division because like, yeah, maybe losing this makes it hard for them to finish first, but I, I think we still feel pretty good about them making the playoffs. And we saw last year, uh, you just make the playoffs and in the South and, you know, it's anybody's game. So uh, I'm not, I would be, I think, less worried about Atlanta for that reason, but I could see it. I could see it both ways, but we got it. We got another really big game to talk about. We do. We do. And I actually evaded making a pick. Uh, <laughs> I, I made it sound like I would take Atlanta. I still think I'm going to take New York, uh, <laughs> but we'll see how it plays out on Saturday night. Again, that game will be available live and free on UFA YouTube starting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. There will be a pregame show starting 15 minutes beforehand. Uh, presented by Power Up. Uh, you're going to want to tune in for that as well. There will be some great uh, segment pieces and interviews from coaches and players from both teams. Uh, but we should move on to the game of the week matchup. Talked about at the very top of this episode. Big battle in the East as 0-1 DC goes on the road to face Philadelphia in their first game of the season and their home opener on Sunday May 5th at 5 p.m. Eastern on Watch UFA TV. Philadelphia hasn't beaten D.C. since 2017, but don't let that stop them from telling you that this is a rivalry game. I mean, these two teams have competed very closely over the past few seasons, but last year, once again, D.C. swept the season series 2-0. In their last meeting, they won 20-18. It was a very close battle but the breeze chiseled out a little bit of a lead towards the end. Thanks once again to some unfortunate second half mistakes from the Phoenix. Uh, Some notable lineup absences or questions going into this one. Rowan is listed as dressed for DC, but not necessarily active. And Jasper Tom and David Bloodgood will once again be out for the DC defense. Two D-line starters absent again against a very powerful offense for the Phoenix and Philly. Looking relatively full strength, they will be without Eric Nardelli, longtime team member since, I believe, almost the inception of the team. He's, I think, the longest tenured member of the Phoenix, uh, as well as uh, Kainoa Chun-Moy, who is a late addition to the roster this year, but was a very central player to their success last year. Again, Mm -hmm. Philly will be looking to be full strength. What are your first takes going into this game? Again, I think you and I have a certain amount of uh, uh, personal investment in this game, given the uh, relative amount of flack we receive online from a certain (laughs) cold birds account. But there's just a lot of intrigue in this matchup in general, not only for, I think, the particularities of their divisional sort of feud, but again, because DC lost on the road last weekend in an interdivisional battle with Salt Lake and looking at the East and looking how much better each team I think is even than we consider going into this year with almost the exception of the two elites in DC and New York. DC, unlike maybe Atlanta can't really afford, I think to go into an O2 hole here, particularly against a Philly team that man, if they're finally the dog that catches the, car bumper on this one i truly wonder what is gonna happen for the phoenix if they get this sort of monkey off their back victory against either dc or new york um you set a dangerous precedent in the power rankings this week by having montreal go up a spot despite losing two close games because if philly loses this game by a goal are we gonna see Hey, why aren't we going up in the power rankings? We lost a close game to a good team. Like that'll be for their them and their god to deal with. <laughs> I don't know, man. They can go. They can go worship at the statue of Rocky Balboa and ask him questions. Why I don't gotta respond to that stuff. Uh, so man, like this game, I feel really good about Philly. I. <laughs> Like, I, I feel really good about Philly going into this game. Hot birds rise. Let's go. Uh, I a team re- that didn't that, – I, one little caveat there. Philly played D.C. close, but in neither game did their offense convert at above a 45% Correct. Clip. Like, that 
it's one of those things where you, you look at so many of the head-to-head -head statistics between DC and Philly, and they're really equal in a lot of different categories. But Philly's Yo, inability to have any kind of efficiency against DC over the last several seasons has been the hamstring issue holding this team back. They just... They are a team so committed to making the big play, to making sort of the the highlight, real, emphatic moment that I feel like the fan friendly avoid. ultimate, as Charlie Hop has called it. <laughs> that was one of the most like I feel like uh, shrewd backhanded compliments I've ever seen a coach give. It's oh. like uh, it's like Tom Izzo in the Big Ten will always compliment other coaches that he perennially just woodsheds uh i felt like that was kind of what hoppus was doing when he called philly entertaining well i the funny thing was i quote tweeted him on that and like i said read what this really means is and you know went on into likes to huck and pray or you know throw 50 50 yeah, balls yeah. and he i saw him at championship week and he's like cam i got so much crap after you quote tweeted that <laughs> sorry man just i i knew what you were really saying look i here's the thing you are right offensively sometimes they do not show up in these games against dc and it's funny because you mentioned the cold Birds twitter you know you know philly philly twitter out there being being as philly as philly can be but the the funny thing is as much as they talk about their close games with new york it's been dc that they have been like seemingly every game right there, right? Like with a chance to win in the fourth quarter. And you're right. Offensively, they have been let down in some of those games. But the thing that I feel good about Philly for a couple of reasons, one being that defensively, they seem to show up consistently. And I do like their defense this. was their backbone last yeah, year. I, feel I like, like this like Philly we, defense a we lot. We undersell like, their defense. I am I'm a little sad that Moy isn't going to be there. Like I do think that this could have been a good opportunity for him to show out. You mentioned Eric Nardelli as well, but I mean, they still have so much to like on that side of the disc. Like Paul Owens is a guy who just like makes things just so hard for people. Um, I, I like offensively. The, I like the talent they have offensively. I really liked what Calvin Trisolini brought last year. Um, and like the talent in terms of like their top end, like where they can reach, I think is up there with some of the best teams in the league. It's, it's been the consistency, right? Like, are they going to do it this week or are they going to do it for, for just two quarters of a game? Or are they going to do it for a whole game? Um, I like what I've been hearing from individual players in the off season about how they want to value the disc war and how they want to up their completion percentage. I think when you're thinking about that throughout an entire off season and it's at the forefront of your mind. And I, like, I can speak to this from personal experience and from watching it with my teammates as well. When you are really committed to that, good things happen. I think look at Levi Jacobs numbers last year from a completion percentage standpoint, like, you know, he decided he was going to make sure that he was completing the next pass and, you know, his huck numbers went down, like he wasn't throwing the disc deep as much, but his throwing percentage went up like three and a half percent better than it had like ever been for a season before. I mean, I think when you're just really committed to that, good things are going to happen uh, in that regard. DC's missing some people as well. Like the fact that DC's coming to this game uh, down some pretty important pieces, the fact that Rowan, who kind of had a mixed bag of a game last week, he did like was he like four goals, two assists, two blocks, but he had three throwaways, but like overall probably net positive there. I would say like he did provide some very good moments for them. Like he, he maybe not playing, I think is a big deal. I still have so many questions about DC's defensive line and being able to even convert breaks when they are given the chance. Like honestly with Philly struggles offensively in the past with like maybe throwing the disc away a little too much. You're, they're also going up against a team who looked really rough uh, when their D-line got the disc last week. So maybe even if Philly is having one of their turnover-prone games, it, it could just not even matter. They have some really great athletes on that O-line that can go get the disc back. And the way that DC's D-line looked last week, that I think that's going to be really possible for them to just have a lot of what, what we refer to in India as a dirty hold, where you have a turnover or two, but still end up scoring anyways. 
Well, and again, this is where I think Bloodgood's absence becomes really highlighted for this DC team. He has been so essential on the counterattack, anchoring them with great throwing the past several seasons. And he's particularly, I think, shown through in these tight East Division tilts. And so his presence will be definitely, or his lack thereof, will be definitely felt for the breeze in Philadelphia on Sunday. I kind of wanted to get back a little bit to what you were talking about with Philly's efficacy on defense against the DC offense. And I wanted to say that I think there might be a little bit of addition through subtraction if Rowan doesn't suit up as far as then the DC backfield just kind of becomes Gus Norbaum and Andrew Roy who combined last weekend had one throwaway and 70 plus completions uh Roy of course had an unfortunate and very uncharacteristic drop on the first possession of the game for DC but aside from that was mistake free all night and I think if DC can get back to what they found in kind of midway through the second quarter going forward as far as an offensive rhythm that will be a problem for this Philadelphia defense I think Philadelphia's defense is very good in a lot of matchups particularly against like a New York Um, I think sometimes they struggle, and especially given their track record of not having beat this Breeze team in several years, of dispossessing small ball teams from the disc. You know, you talk about Paul Owens and Eric Whitmer and these handler defenders of the Phoenix. They're very capable, but there's almost almost sort of a shred-like overaggression with which they pursue the takeaway or the block. And it allows for these sort of more shrewd, uh, uh, tight window passers of Norbaum and Roy to exploit that. Mm-hmm. They're just so good, I think, at taking advantage of small discrepancies and defenses that is really destabilizing mentally for defenders. Like, you're just not used to dying by a thousand paper cuts. And that's something that Norbaum and Roy will do to you gladly, basically every possession that they can. And I think you started to see that against Salt Lake a little bit. You know, the shred, I think, could have put away the breeze by a few more goals. And yet, DC just kept hanging around in that game. And if you look between sort of the, the bigger stats, a lot of that was... DC slowly getting back that rhythm throughout the the latter three quarters of we're just going to pound in an offensive possession. We're just going to run this down your throat. We're not going to do anything sexy all the way up the field. And we still got a lineup full of, again, Roy Norbaum, Tyler Monroe, Thomas Edmonds was great last weekend. Was. That's somebody that I think that Philly didn't really have to game plan for defensively. And will now have to really figure out who they're going to put on him. Kind of figures to be like a, an Eric Whitmer, Max Triflis, But I don't know if they have the sort of discipline to deal with Edmonds' versatility. Again, I, I, I hear what you're saying about I think Philly definitely has a puncher's chance as they kind of always do in this matchup. But when you kind of dig a little bit deeper, this DC team is still... I think championship level. And I think that they almost get the benefit of flying a little bit under the radar now. Like they took a really good shot from a good shred team and now they get to kind of piece things together in a way where they, they really haven't had that luxury the past two years. You know, they came in as, as this team adding a lot of talent, putting in some real star players in the skill position roles and, and having heavy expectations this year, there's a little bit less of that. And so maybe they can develop into something that is better off later on in the season. Totally possible, but no, not happening this week. <laughs> nope. All right. So then I'll ask, who are you taking in this matchup? I mean, it's, I'm taking Philly. I'm taking Philly. Right. Um, I mean, it's not going to be like they win by five goals. I mean, obviously DC is too good of a team, I think, to like, get blown out like I'm not saying that I just I just feel really good about Philly this week you know and you mentioned Max Triflis and Eric Whitmer and Matt Hanna another guy who had double digit blocks for them last year great Um, great mention there I've really liked Hanna over the past couple years for them yeah and like even like it's one of those things too like I said I look at their O-line numbers and like these guys are getting blocks too and I just feel like as much as their D-line 
DC's D line struggled last week, and they still don't have Bloodgood this week. They still don't have Jasper Tom this week. Um, the fact that even despite what you want to say about like, is it addition by subtraction if Rowan's on offense or not? I mean, he typically is a pretty good defensive option when he's there to you know be on that counter attack and get a D or two here and there. So it's like, even if it is, you're still losing a player that can contribute. So I, I just, I really like the fact that it's, well, this is a game that's in Philly, um, DC, maybe still trying to figure out exactly what their offense is going to look like this week. Still, still really struggling with the deep ball. I, I really just feel good about Philly this week. I think this is finally where they punch through and beat one of these, you know, New York, win one of these New York DC games that they've had a lot of close matchups with these teams and just have not been able to put quite enough together to get over the top. Um, so I'm riding, I'm riding with the hot birds. It's a dangerous thing. It kind of feels like, you know, riding a motorcycle without a helmet, weaving in and out of traffic because you just don't know what's going to happen. But I'm going to enjoy the ride while while it's good, I guess. Yeah, I mean, or just a phoenix being engulfed in flames and then having rebirth. It, it's it's very apt for this team. Uh, I just wanted to make a qualification to the ad- addition by subtraction comment for sure. Rowan to take nothing away, obviously, from his supreme talents, but. In these Philly matchups last year, he had seven turnovers in two games. Yeah. It's not nothing to shake a stick at. So, uh, but I, I got to disagree with you on this one. I'm still going to take DC. I think that he got something to prove coming off of that shred matchup. I think that they're going to have big games from Edmonds, Cole Jurek, Ty, Tyler Monroe. And I think that that defense, for as much as they struggled last weekend, that's kind of their floor. That's sort of the seller. And so it's only a little bit up from there. And if they even get three, four breaks in this game, I think it's going to make a big, big difference. The question mark for me is what you mentioned too about DC's deep attack. They finished last of the 16 teams active in week one in Huck completion percentage, completing just 20% of their deep shots. Second to last, New York. So... Really interesting, I think, developments here at the top of the East Division for those two elite teams. Again, both will be in action this weekend. New York on Saturday night in the Super Series game, free on UFA YouTube. DC Sunday night against Philly in the Watch UFA TV game of the week. We've still got seven games to go to and not a whole bunch of time. So, Cam, let's engage in a little bit of hot and cold. Sure. I'm going to give you a game and you're going to give me a take as to what might be hot and what might be cold. You can choose either team. You can pick the both the same team twice, excuse me, but it's just kind of getting a little bit of our toes dipped into each of these remaining seven games. So we're going to start with Seattle's really intriguing, I think, week two road doubleheader. Starting on Friday night against the 1-0 Oakland Spiders, Seattle will be without Lucas Ambrose, who had, of course, four blocks in his debut with the Cascades last weekend. He will be active on Saturday night. Oakland will be down a a few notable players, including uh, Justin Lim, Jace Bruner, Jake Thorne, as well as Raycon Atkins and Dexter Clyburn, the latter two two of whom were on last year's all-rookie teams. Again, my question to you is, what is something hot and what is something cold about the Seattle and Oakland tilt on Friday night? So hot is Seattle, Seattle's D-lines. Oh my goodness. Uh, Granted, they were playing against a San Diego team that seems to be going through kind of a rebuild right now. But, you know, just... Seattle won those San Diego games last year, but they were fairly like they were fairly close games. There wasn't like these huge numbers. I mean, they doubled them up, and it was it was over early. Um, it was there was no question by the end of the first quarter. Like it was already decided. Like you could tell Seattle was going to win that game. We knew that offensively that they were going to be better. Um, we 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 felt that going into the season, and the question was defensively. We, we figured they're going to be better. Can they get more blocks and convert? They converted really well. My cold going into this game is Oakland's 
completion percentage from last week, their win against LA, it was some ugly ultimate on both sides of the disc. Lots of turnovers, lots of hucks, lots of questionable decisions. I don't feel good about them going in against this game against Seattle where their D-line played so well. Uh, I'm going to say that my hot for this game is Khalif El Salam. I feel like he was really good against the Spiders last year, and I feel like he's going to have a bit of a chip on his shoulder wanting this win and pushing Seattle to 2-0, and especially knowing that they have Colorado to face on Saturday night, which will be actually how we transition into this next hot or cold question for you. Hot or cold, Seattle's second game of the weekend, Saturday night against the Summit in Colorado's home opener at Marv K Stadium. What do you have as a, a hot or cold element for either team? Well, I'm actually going to start cold here. It can get kind of cold up in the mountains in Colorado. No Quinn Finer in the opening game. Huge loss for them. Alex Atkins will be there, and you know he's ter- certainly capable of carrying the load offensively, but... Quinn Finer is one of my, you know, kind of preseason potential MVP picks. I'm really worried about. Especially after how that disc looked in week one. You talk about edge control and sort of velocity out of hand. I Mm -hmm. mean, Finer can just rip that disc. Yeah. Um, Hot for me in this game, though, is Colorado starting off the season with their D-line players healthy. This was a big issue as they went through the season last year. They had so many great athletes on the defensive line. It seems like. Most of them are ready to go in this game. Um, what last year uh, you mentioned? I mean, you you have the more off the top of my head. Uh, like Saeed Semrin was like a big one, like insane athlete. Like when you look at the defensive athletes that they have, it's just kind of insane that they lose Cody Spicer and still seem to have one of the most athletic big D lines in the entire league. And I love that, especially. Second game of the weekend for Seattle, so they're going to have maybe some tired legs. I think the Colorado D-line is going to feast uh, in this game. Yeah, the tired legs, the second game of a back-to-back on the road could really spell trouble with Seattle. You talk about uh, Saeed Semrin, but then I think you even got to mention the 2022 All-Rookie Team members in Matthew Ag and Alex Tatum, both of whom uh, missed some pretty significant time last season mm-hmm. and just... Looked, I think, like different versions of their explosive selves in single coverage than what we were used to in the rookie years in 2022. And then I think somebody who set as a goal last year to be the league leader in blocks, but was actually outdone by his former roommate in Lucas Ambrose, uh, Noah Kuhlman in his second Mm -hmm. season with the Summit could really be somebody to watch elevate into a star level performer. He's had some issues, I think, with physicality as far as his, uh, 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 he's somebody who throws himself around at such a volume that it makes sense that Ambrose was who he roomed with in college. I mean, there's just, (laughs) there's a horizontal dimension to Kuhlman's game that is sort of hard to find a peer to other than Ambrose. Uh, And with that came, I think, a little bit of, uh, over-aggressive, bordering on aggro, aggro and dangerous play. But towards the back end of last year, I think Kuhlman really figured it out. And into the club season, he really kind of rounded out more elements of his game. I think he's going to be somebody who's going to surprise a lot of people as a thrower, especially on the counterattack. And so, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that that Colorado defense is going to be a real bear for Seattle on the second game of back-to-back. But moving on, let's get to a South Division matchup. 1-0 1-0 Houston going and visiting Austin, who will be making their 2024 debut at home. What are two, well, one of each hot and cold elements that you're looking forward to in this game? I'm sure the weather is going to be hot in those Texas games, man. Um, I mean, hot, can, can you say anything other than Ben Lewis? I mean, that that game Jimmy he had last week you was You can insane. say Jimmy Zura, too. Jeez Louise. I mean... What was he plus 14, like nine goals, four assists? Like, I mean, that is three just, blocks, 670 total yards. Just stupid. I tuned into that game uh, after finishing the Boston Glory game. And uh, I swear, I just kept all I heard for the whole broadcast was Ben Lewis, Ben Lewis, Ben Lewis. Um, 
So, I mean, it's hard to go anywhere else. And, you know, shout out to Houston. Congrats. First time in their franchise history being above 500. Of course, they were an expansion team that came into the league last year. So that's got to be a good feeling to start off with a win. Um, I don't really have anything cold for Austin. We haven't seen them play yet this year. I'm excited to get a first look at them. So I am going to stick with Houston. And cold, I'm going to go with kind of everything else that happened around Ben Lewis. They had 20, they nearly had 30 throwaways last week, 29 throwaways um, completed 80, only 88% of their passes. I, it, it looked fairly windy. It's, it seems like it's windy in, in those Texas games all the time, but they just have to find a way to value the disc. If they have put numbers up like that against Austin, it's going to be a long night for Houston. Yeah. My hot is Austin's defense. They're coming off a record setting year for break rate. They set an all time UFA record for a single season and they actually return arguably their best defender from the 2022 season in Jake Reinhardt, the team's puller. He didn't even get to take advantage of the new pulling rules last season. So mm-hmm. it'd be really interesting to see if the sole defense can actually level up even half a level or more, given that they're returning sort of the guy who sets everything up for them in an era in which pulling is becoming, I think the meta, I, that was one of my takeaways from week one. The more and more I think about it is that teams who can really dictate field position and how your offense scrambles into formation have such an advantage in this league. I mean, you look at how Carolina, how Minnesota, even Salt Lake played at times. I mean, I think DC had some trouble establishing the rhythm at the beginning of that game because they were pinned so far back in their own end zone. I mean, that Andrew Roy drop on the first possession took place mere five yards outside of his own goal line. And so I just feel like Austin returning a puller and a defender, the caliber of Jake Reinhardt to an already excellent unit is going to be tough sledding for a Houston team that definitely looks like it's coming up a bit, but you know, 26 goals against the Dallas team that that was already ranked last in uh, uh, scoring allowed. It, it's nice. I don't know if it's exactly a feather in the cap. But mm-hmm. moving on to another doubleheader road weekend in the West. Salt Lake taking their 1-0 and record to SoCal. Friday night, they will face San Diego. On Saturday, they will face LA. San Diego 1-1 one and one after week one. LA Oh, and one after their loss in Oakland. Cam, what do you have as far as hot and cold for this Salt Lake team on the road looking to keep momentum and down a couple of notable starters? Will Selfridge will be missing the road trip, as well as Tony Monga and Johnny Hoffman. Grant Lindsley will be unavailable on Friday night in San Diego, but he will be there for the more important tilt of the two against the Aviators on Saturday. Uh, yeah, I mean... I feel like there's so many different directions you could go with Salt Lake um, in the hot category. They, they did look pretty, uh, pretty good last week. Um, you know, wire to wire victory against DC. We expect to be really, you know, DC to be a good team as they have been for a number of years now. I actually want to go over to San Diego though. Like they, they really struggled in that first game, but I think one thing that just is like, it's, it's the immovable rock. It'll be there forever. Like Travis Dunn just, it just kind of continues to not matter like who's around him, people coming in and out of the lineup. He was plus eight in that game. Second game last weekend. Um, I do want to shout him out because he's been a great player in this league for a long time now. And even when the results aren't, you know, not what it was when they were seemingly winning division or top near the top of the division all the time. Like he just continues to produce like game in game out. And I'm just continue to be impressed by that. Um, you know, Salt Lake, I could go any number of ways. Um, cold for this game. It'll be interesting to see the Salt Lake offense. Like, I, I don't fear for them. I think they're so talented, but they're missing Will Selfridge for both games, not having Grant Lindsley for one of the game. Grant Lindsley looked great in that DC game. Uh, so did Will Selfridge. Like, you could argue they were two of the best, like, four or five players on the field. Um, so what does the offense look like down those two guys? I don't know. I should mention McKay Jorgensen, who was absent from Salt Lake's home opener, will be making his 2024 debut this weekend. He was an all rookie team member last year and just, I think, a visible uh, uh, backfield just corroborator with his brother Luke. I mean, they just have that sibling bond that makes fluidity as passers so central to a good offense. 
Now, how about you? Um, for Salt Lake, I'll go hot. Uh, Jordan Kerr. I think it's going to be a big Jordan Kerr weekend. I think he just kind of picked his spots last weekend. Didn't have a turnover. Finished twenty twenty from the field, over three hundred eighty yards. I think six scores. Ho hum for him. Uh, I I see him turning up the dial a notch or two this weekend. I think the absence of Selfridge will force a little bit out of the MVP runner up from the past two seasons. And yeah, I just, I think it's going to be a big Kerr weekend. Um, on the flip side, cold, this 0-2 hole for LA that they're looking straight down the barrel at. I, you know, it'll be the season debut for Brandon Van Dusen, who was the second highest volume passer in the league last season. And somebody that I think LA visibly missed last weekend in Oakland, given their turnover struggles and some of the just, I think, uh, passing deficiencies. Uh, Pavel was very solid, but he didn't stretch the field much at all. And without Van Dusen in the lineup, it was pretty evident that the Aviators have a bit of a hucking problem, I think, on offense. There's a little bit of a lacking vertical dimension to this Aviators attack. And so I think against an athletic uh, shred defense, it's going to be tough, even down Munga and Hoffman. There's still plenty of able-bodied defenders on this shred defense. They proved that year in and year out. And again, like we ta- we've talked again how Atlanta can go into an O2 hole. It doesn't really mean as much. DC going into an O2 hole, uh, pretty pretty treacherous waters. LA going into an O2 hole with Seattle improved, with Oakland getting the first win out of the way against the Aviators, with Colorado and Salt Lake. I, it's tough, man. Yeah, like really and tough. Even and even San Diego, like San Diego perennially plays LA so close because they know them so well. Mm-hmm. And so my cold is just LA in their headspace. Like where are they going to land? I think that again, they punched above their weight kind of last year. They ended up in a place much sooner than I think anyone anticipated. And so now is sort of the recalibration and, starting this crowded West division season without a winning your first two games. It just, it feels, feels like one of those holes. That's a little bit insurmountable. I do want to add one more thing onto that. Like mentioning LA, like Sean McDougal needs to be better. And it's like, it not, and this isn't a criticism of him saying like he had, I mean, I think by his standards, he did have a bad game last week. He had three turnovers. He had two throwaways and a drop. Um, he needs to be all a UDL caliber if that offense is going to be successful. I think just we saw last year how great he could be. Um, we've seen it in the past and other seasons. And when in the games where he was great, they they won, right? Like he he seemed to be just that. We mentioned it. He is scoring the goals, and then when there's a turnover, he gets it back. And he needs to be great week in and week out for them to stay alive in this division. Yeah, and I think that might be a terrific point that you're bringing up. It's like they were so good at those margin calls last year. And it was because McDougal was just playing out of his mind for so much of the season. Mm -hmm. And when he's not just in that locked in zone level this aviators team doesn't quite have the magic and, and it's so I think unfair to him and to some of the other skill position players on this team, that that is the truth of where their success lies, but that is the truth of where their success lies. They're going to be a margin team. They kind of need their star players to carry them over the finish line. And without that, they have performances like last weekend against Oakland, where they just sort of get out emotion balled. You know, like it wasn't like Oakland was playing necessarily better. They just had a handful more of, quote unquote, the important plays in the game. And it felt like in 2023, L.A. was the team able to make that because they had, again, McDougal, Giannis, Brandon Van Dusen, a host of defenders, Mitchell Steiner. Uh, We'll see if they can get more of that this last week, this next week. Uh, Andrew Padula had a great game last weekend for L.A. We'll see if he can replicate his three block performance. Longtime veteran. Final two games to get to for hot and cold. Uh, we can go really quick through these. Chicago at Detroit. Detroit, of course, carrying a 73-game losing streak into their season opener, hosting Chicago as well, making their 2024 debut. Hot and cold for this matchup. 
uh, hot. I'm ready to see the Lithiel era in Chicago and see how what he looks like. I'm excited to see how much usage he gets. I mean, cold. 73 games in a row. No more to say. Yeah. That. We don't got to linger on that. Uh, and then moving on to the final game of the weekend, Toronto at Boston. Toronto making their season debut. Boston looking to start 2-0 and after they got their home opener win last weekend. Rush had a good game in their second meeting against Boston, but lost by double digits in their first meeting in 2023. Kind of a tough matchup for the Rush. I think they're going to have a lot of issues with Glory's size. And again, just with dealing with the reigning MVP, Jeff Babbitt, now in Boston's lineup. Uh, what's your hot and cold for this matchup? Yeah, and no Phil Turner for this game. If there was somebody yeah, who was going to take exactly. that matchup. Uh, my hot is seeing the potential of an Orion Cable, Jeff Babbitt on the line together. That sounds awesome. Imagine being Simon Carapella and just being like, yeah, go pay attention to those two guys. Like, let me just rake over here. Um, I think that's going to be a really fun uh, duo to watch in the cutting space. Uh, I'm excited to see how they use them. Cold has to be the absences from the rush. It's their first game. They already had a number of roster departures from last year. They're missing guys like uh, like guys like Phil Turner this week. Like Phil Turner is, and Brandon Adibe is not playing this week either. Like Phil Turner is like, for my like he's one of the top handful of defenders in this entire league if you're gonna have a chance um you're gonna need to have him available all the time so uh first look at toronto it'd be interesting to see what they look like with this new lineup and yet of all the teams that i feel like could just come out and slip on a proverbial banana peel against an opponent like the rush i feel like it could be boston trying to integrate too much too quickly too soon you know like I, I don't know. There's there's something sort of oddball about this rush team where yes, they've had some pretty big name departures, but their their youth and the way in which I feel like they might be playing together could be really good against Boston, who is still struggling to find their identity. But and they're missing some. Given how Boston too. looked and how good their stars looked last week, I don't know that that's they are out. Sadok, what Sadok, Tanner Johnson, go Ben Katz. Uh, what Jay Clark, Chris Bartoli. I mean, they have a number of people who are out. So, I mean, you might be right. Like this could be the stub your toe game. Toronto's going to be excited. First game of the season, have a lot of energy. I don't know. We'll see. There's a lot of matchups for Boston. Look forward to it. Could be one of those ones that they just didn't do enough game planning for Toronto and Luke Comire and Oscar Stonehouse and Griffin McKee and Keith McRae get a little bit going for the rush, but We'll have to tune in and find out all of that this coming weekend on Watch UFA TV as well as UFA YouTube. But that'll wrap up here for this episode and preview pod of Swing Pass. Again, you should tune in to the aforementioned channels to check out all of the games, all nine of them coming up in week two action. Cam and I will be back in just a couple days to recap all of it with you. We're looking forward so much to the coming weeks of the 2024 UFA regular season. I know, Cam, you're now just a week away from your start to the season. Finally. Been pins and needles up until this point. Can't wait to talk about it more with you as you get into the live action as well. We'll tune in with you in not too long. Thanks for listening. Talk soon. Bye now. The greatest teams, the biggest games, and the thrill of Frisbee. The Ultimate Frisbee Association Super Series continues Saturday, May 4th, when the New York Empire take on the Atlanta Hustle.